Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome towards the end of day one. Uh, hopefully, you've all had the opportunity to join different sessions throughout the day and are looking forward to tomorrow as well. As we look to conclude day one, I've got the opportunity to be joined in this fireside chat, although there's no fire around me, uh, but uh, by Patty Poppy. So, Patty, thanks again for your time today to join us. It's always a pleasure, Scott. Nice to be with you. Yeah, so tell me, how are things up in Michigan these days? They're good. Fall, it's gorgeous. We took a little road trip this uh, last weekend and saw all the glory and beauty of Michigan all around us. It was just stunning. Well, I'll tell you, I don't think fall's in the air in Austin. It's going to be 93 degrees here today. So as a Midwesterner, uh, you know, I'm from the neighboring state of Ohio originally. Uh, but as a Midwesterner, I do miss those fall days and seeing the, the leaves turn. Now, are you excited that uh, Big Ten football's right around the corner? Counting the minutes. We actually had a, a, a preseason. We watched all the old classics just to get <laughs> us ready. We're ready. And trust you me, know, there's some you're... Buckeye Michigan games that were worth watching again. Yeah, no, if you're like me, the Big Ten Network, even down here, I have it on quite often. And you're right, there were a lot of these games, and I never, I assumed that the Buckeyes had won because they were showing that, but you never know. You never know. <laughs> well, yeah, looking forward to our battle at the end of this year. Well, again, thanks again for joining. And, um, you know, really, I think a great opportunity to hear from you as we think about our themes of resiliency and sustainability um, and, and you know, this opportunity to come together as an industry. I know these are real important themes to you. And as we got to have time to talk, you know, this concept, I know you've talked a lot about that's real personal to you about the triple bottom line. I just thought if you would uh, just take some time and kind of share what it means to you, what it means to your organization, uh, that'd be great. Happy to do it. You know, uh, when I became CEO, the company was running great. Uh, everything was going well. Um, and in fact, the board's instructions basically were don't screw it up. <laughs> like, okay. I've heard those instructions myself before. <laughs> yeah. Sit in my office, do nothing. No, I knew that wa that was not reasonable to think I would sit in my office and do nothing. And so the team thought we should dust off our purpose. Um, what do we want our legacy to be? I had some turnover at the senior management team the same time that I became CEO. So it was really a great fresh start. And one of the things that emerged from that work was the triple bottom line. We knew that that's how we wanted to measure our impact, not just the bottom line, like a lot of businesses. And in fact, in business school, they teach us to your obligation is to serve the shareholders. That is one obligation, but it's not the only obligation. And we knew that if we serve people, planet and profit, we could uh, provide a sustainable business for the next generation. And so that's what we really set out to do. And how has that resonated with your teams? How is that? How do you see that really kind of coming maybe virtually these days? But you're going to talk to me about how that's energized the organization. You know, I didn't realize how powerful it would be and how what an impact it would have on many things. But I'll just break it down a little bit. So first, like when we say people, you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about certainly our customers. That's sort of expected uh, the communities we serve, but also my coworkers. And I think they may have been feeling unattended. You know, there's a big, we had a big customer focus. We we're working on customers, but, you know, we can only serve our customers as well as each of our team members feel served. And so we really spent a lot of time making sure that we had the cultural attributes that our team would feel good about. We have our sort of our purpose statement. How, what we say to ourselves is CMS energy, world-class performance, delivering hometown service. And so we tell a lot of stories about what does world-class performance look like? What does hometown service look like? One of my favorite hometown service stories, and I still see this all the time, a, a funeral director will send us a letter or maybe a family member and say, you know, our family funeral uh, last week, we were driving down the road in the procession and one of your crews was on the side of the road and they stopped their work and they either put their hands or their hard hats on their heart as we passed by. Now, wow. you don't have that in a procedure manual anywhere, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's just people who have embodied what hometown service really means to us while they're doing world-class work, safely replacing pipeline or safely uh, restringing conductor or whatever. I mean, it's just very touching some of the stories I hear from people. And so 
Uh, we do feel strongly that the people part of the triple bottom line needs to show up every day. Yeah, no, that's great. That, that story reminds me, having worked in the services industry, and obviously we serve your customers on a daily basis, but I remember a story. There was a gentleman named Steve Pittman, and Steve was one of my technicians. And Steve was running late to an appointment and felt really bad that this customer had been waiting all day. And so he took an opportunity to ring before he was going just to let the customer know he was on the way. And he said, hey, is there anything I can get you on the way? And the customer, I think, just said, yeah, stop and get me a gallon of milk. Probably not expecting it to happen at all. Steve, on the way over, stopped, bought a gallon of milk, showed up at the house, and delivered to the customer. And it's those little impacts that, as organizations, we're able to give to our communities and to those I serve. And those stories just kind of stick with you, and they it certainly make me smile. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt. And I think it gives people a higher purpose and showing up for doing the job. You know, you can have a job or you can have a purpose. And so our team, I think, is pretty compelled by uh, the triple bottom line, which, of course, Planet is a, a key part. And I would say it probably is the biggest change uh, from when I became CEO. Um, you know, we really did not acknowledge climate change prior to that. We um, were silent. We weren't necessarily deniers, but we weren't uh, actively seeking to reduce the pace of climate change. And so since 2016, we've retired seven of our 12 coal plants. We've published our clean energy plan, which has uh, zero coal. Um, and we're really excited about what we replace that with. And I think there's a sense of urgency for our team that when you're closing plants, you have a big decision to make about what you replace them with. And we've decided that we're gonna replace them with only new renewables and, which will be music to your ears, and many of your listeners, I know I'm singing to the choir here, uh, our uh, energy waste reduction and demand response. We're super excited about the idea that, particularly in Michigan, we were talking about Michigan, there's a summer peak that it adds at least 50% of demand on a handful of summer days. If we can shave that demand and shave that peak and shift the whole curve down while we're retiring coal plants, then we are not required to replace them with more fossil fuels. We can replace them with clean modular renewables as a great complement to things like our hydro pump storage up in Ludington, Michigan. And so for us, our planet commitment uh, our goal of being net zero by 2040, which is about a decade earlier than many, has a huge component of energy waste reduction and demand response. And in fact, we're not building three new power plants as a result of our energy waste plans. And so I'm really excited about what technology can do for that, what partnerships with Clear Result can do for that, and uh, what our team can deliver, our teams can deliver together. And this 2040, I'm excited as well. Uh, 2040, you know, cause I, it was interesting when I looked at that and I saw the goals that you've got ahead of you. Tell me, does it feel close or does it feel far away or does every day it feels a bit closer? You know, some of it feels close. Um, uh, we have our next two coal units scheduled for 2023. That feels like tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we also are banking on technology advancement over time. And so when we see the potential for battery storage, um, or even there's a lot of talk right now about, hi um, about hydrogen, is, is there gonna be a transformative technology advancement that really enables it to maybe go faster? Uh, so right now we're, we're pacing it to technology that we can um, foresee, and I'm really bullish on storage being a critical um, a complement to the new renewables that we're doing. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think the one thing I've heard over and over again is that theme that maybe today we've got line of sight to half of that goal, but we're really dependent on innovation to achieve that next half. But if you look at the speed of innovation over the last 10 years, and this is our 10th anniversary, and we were looking back and, and, and looking back at where we were 10 years ago versus today, and, and it's, again, it's hard to fathom where we'll be 10 years from now, but I think it is certainly not out of reason to expect the technology will evolve to help fill that gap. Well, and I'll tell you a funny story. We had, uh, we were in the midst of doing the modeling for our clean energy plan, which we filed with our commission and had approved last summer. But so it was about maybe a year and a half ago. 
And I got a call or a text on a Saturday morning from my head of engineering. And uh, he said, you know, do you have a minute? We need to talk. I was like, sure. And so we talked for about an hour and a half. And uh, but his first question was, uh, because our clean energy plan represented the triple bottom line, it looked very different from any other resource plan we had ever developed prior. Uh, there were no new gas plants, which was unusual. And uh, he asked me, he said, Patty, what if we're wrong? Like his professional reputation was at stake. You know, these are the engineers of our company saying we can take a stand for zero coal, all new renewables, demand response, energy efficiency as our model. And um, I told him, I said, Tim, I can guarantee you we are wrong. It's 20 years. Like, <laughs> some things are going to change. We'll have underestimated some things, overestimated other things. It's our best forecast. But this is what I think real leadership is required is when a leader can take a stand for something that has not yet been true. It's easy to write a plan about everything you know to be true. It takes vision and leadership. And we often say leaders, uh, you know, some people might say, uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Leaders say, I'll see it because I believe it. Mm. Like we're going to make that so. That future yeah. will happen because we have caused it to happen. And so, uh, Tim, it took definitely some talking into, you know, the team to relax, like, yeah, we're going to have some mistakes, but it's really been transformative for our company. Yeah, no, that, that word vision is what kept coming to mind is painting that vision. And I think you've done just that. Uh, I think some people will be okay with that vagary of getting there. To your point, others maybe like to have that that linear view into where we're going. I but have I, peers I, who have tried to coach me on having the exactness, <laughs> and, and I just don't buy it. I, I really believe that we can create the future. Like, you can make it true by creating the expectation. We've created a marketplace for renewable energy in Michigan and the prices are dropping faster than we forecast. You know, these things can be caused and that's what leaders do, I think. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And one of the things when I think about Michigan is I think about the automobile. And I think about, you know, obviously with the electrification of transportation, how do you see that both Michigan leading there, you know, as, as, as a state that's led for so long in transportation, but what do you think that impact will be to load, to demand, to this journey that you're on? I think it is extremely consequential and very <laughs> exciting. Um, uh, I talked about my road trip up north in, in northern Michigan, and uh, thankfully we've installed some electric vehicle infrastructure so that I could take a road trip up north in my EV and uh, get where I needed to get and know that I would have the uh, electricity that I needed. But, you know, I think the electric, the electrification of transportation has two key roles. One, the obvious, changing the emissions of vehicles. And in 2018, for the first time ever, uh, transportation had more carbon emissions than power generation. Wow. Enough coal plants have closed that now transportation is the number one source of carbon emissions. Hmm. Okay, so that's a big deal. Uh, so electrifying transportation with that cleaner energy is really an important part. But the part that I think is um, more for us industry wonks <laughs> is that as long as we can manage the charging and motivate, create customer programs that allow for people to know that they are charging off peak, which today always means at night, but in the future when we have excess solar in the middle yeah. of the day, charging midday will be when we want people to charge. So that, that motivation for customers and the ability for them to know and participate in charging off peak actually allows us to not build more power generation infrastructure, but just more fully utilize that infrastructure that we have. So again, we're closing plants, we're adding renewables, we use EVs to lift the off-peak demand. Now the outcome of that is lower cost of electricity for everyone because we're more fully utilizing existing assets. That is a piece that people don't fully appreciate, but 
it's electric vehicles will be the biggest thing that's happened to the electricity industry since air conditioning. It's that kind of load. Yeah. And we have now technology both on vehicle and in home that can optimize when that charging happens. And it's sort of that simple. Mm. You know, you can get more complex and think about vehicles being roving and mobile storage that can be deployed to the grid. That's that's possible. But even that isn't necessary. What we really just the fundamental of being able to more fully utilize existing assets with EVs charging off peak is a huge game changer for the cost of that clean energy transition for the cost reduction associated with carbon reduction, which people don't expect. They assume it will cost more. It yeah. actually will cost less. Yeah, exactly. It's like intuitively, when you step back, you, they, you don't put all the pieces together. But when you do, as you've painted it, wow, aligning all those things together. And I think technology and innovation are a big enabler. Uh, it just creates a, such a unique environment. And to me, that's what's exciting. That's what's exciting yeah. now about this industry that we're in, is all these things are happening, and they're all happening in real time, and people are learning along the way. I mean, I, I similarly, I have an electric vehicle here. And for me, you know, right now, just finding charging points sometimes can be challenging, let alone having that intelligence to know when to charge my vehicle. But it's exciting. I get excited. I don't have to put a lot of gas in my car. But, you know, nonetheless, I mean, there's all the little benefits that you get. And everybody takes, I think, something different that's unique to them along that journey. And it sounds like you guys in Michigan are well poised to kind of lead the way there. Well, as you said, you know, it's the home of the U.S. auto industry, the, the our, our auto industry pet created the future back in the 20s and 30s and it's just happening again and i'm so proud of uh all the automakers but definitely general motors and ford have just stepped out there to really commit to this electrical uh electrification of transportation and electric vehicle future and i think that's just it is super exciting and they're fun to drive. As you know, you can really get some acceleration <laughs> when you hit the throttle, you're going to go and that's fun. They're yeah, fun for me, drive. it seems to me that it's the truck and the SUV market that, you know, enables that, you know, there's such a fascination with trucks and SUVs today that the, any, there's a lot, I know a lot happening in that space, but once that really unlocks the potential, it just seems like there'll be a floodgate that opens. Yeah. I'm looking forward to GM's Hummer that they're going to build at the, at the plant where I used to work, Detroit Hamtramck. I spent eight years of my career there. And so uh, when one of those bad boys comes off the end of the line, I'm going to be pretty excited about that. Yeah, back to this. Intuitively, you would have never thought the Hummer brand would be the brand you're going to tie to an electric vehicle. Well, let's. I don't want to lose sight of the, of the triple bottom line as well. So we've talked about people. We've talked about planet. Maybe talk about then how that aligns with prosperity or profitability. Yeah, and you know, I often interchange the word profit and prosperity because when Michigan prospers, we profit. Like that's, we, we only as a company win when Michigan is winning. And so I think the prosperity part of the triple bottom line, there's kind of two key points. One, I was, um, I had the opportunity, we had one of the uh, co-CEOs of Whole Foods come speak to our management team about conscious capitalism and how profits are not bad. Profit is not a bad word. And I often think sometimes, especially in the utility industry, we feel a little guilty, like profit seems like a bad thing. You know, we're a monopoly. What does that mean that we make a profit? Maybe that's not good. No, here's why it's good. Because when you are a profitable entity, you can have a bigger impact on the world. And if your goals are noble, like a triple bottom line of serving people, planet, and prosperity, then your profits fund that. They make it sustainable. They make it possible for the long run, and you can have a bigger impact on the world. And so uh, when I heard him say that to my team, and Whole Foods, of course, is famous for really the ethos of, of their brand, uh, it, it motivated us, you know, that we could be more and really have a bigger impact because we're profitable. But one of my favorite kind of triple bottom line stories that ties it all together and how we can create prosperity for our communities is, you know, when we made the decision to close our six coal plants on that, on one of the last days, the, the last day at one of the facilities I was there and uh, I was with the people, I wasn't sure what mood they would be in. When I arrived, are they going to be mad? Will yeah. they be protesting? Like, 
it's a big deal. We were shutting down a plant that had been in uh, southeastern Michigan for 70 plus years. Yeah, you probably had second and third generations that oh, had yes. worked there, right? Yeah, their yeah, livelihood absolutely. that came from that plant. Big deal, very emotional. And so I showed up and actually the team was not angry. They were proud. Hmm. They were actually on a record run. They're in the top 10 of all runs, longest running uh, consecutive days. They're on day 527. Uh, they're they're in the top 10 of all plants in the history of power generation in the nation <laughs> on that run. And we shut them down, which was kind of like, oh, that was painful. <laughs> but, you know, the team was proud that they had um, so successfully served the people of Michigan. And when I asked the group, uh, how many of you are retiring tomorrow? Half the half the group, maybe about 50 people were retiring the next day, which told me that they had organized their lives around this day to fulfill their duty. Yeah. And they felt great about that. The other half all had jobs somewhere else in the company. We had made sure that we gave enough notice. We prepared them so the people were ready. Now, I'm going to tell you, when we were down in the control room in the final moments, it was very emotional. Hmm. It was um, sort of like a hospital room because all these alarms start coming because we were out of fuel. And the, they had brought the most senior person at the plant to kind of push the final alarm clear on the board. But the shift supervisor was silencing each of the alarms as they were coming in. And it honestly felt like a hospital room. And I will tell you, all of us, including the burliest of burly, were in tears. Like mm -hmm. it was a moment, but we were proud. Yeah. What had been accomplished. So that's sort of how the people part of the triple bottom played out. Obviously, the planet was enhanced with the uh, elimination of those emissions from a coal fueled power plant. And then the prosperity comes because we didn't just leave this hulking remnant of what used to be with this plant on this site. We hired a decommissioning firm who also redevelops those sites. And so all of our power plant locations, the plants are coming down, fully decommissioned, gone, so that those highly valuable resources that often have multimodal transportation of rail and highways and uh, electrical infrastructure can be redeveloped. They're redeveloping those for those local communities so that there's a new economic opportunity in that town. And that's sort of one of my favorite triple bottom line examples. We don't just stop at close the plant. We think about it from all three of those aspects. And that, in my opinion, is the most sustainable business model. Yeah, that's great. I mean, as you just as you described that, I kept thinking how that triple bottom line not only impacts your organization, but it's impacting the communities you serve through the redevelopment. You know, the, the great thing I think about that journey is there's job creation along the way as, well, as whether it's in electrification of the vehicles, whether it's into these alternate energy sources, and then these communities, ultimately, it becomes the state. And so you could go to the macro of the state, I think, all the way down to the micro of a community that's dealing with these changes. And along the way, whether, you know, I think all three of those P's relate to each of those different groups. Yeah, it's been, it's, it's very motivating. You know, we get up every day knowing that we are literally helping save the planet like that, that we are absolutely doing that. And our customers get to do that with us. Yeah, I know. You know, I can that resonates with me because leading an organization that gets to work alongside you and many of our clients to do just that. There is something incredibly inspiring about waking up to do that every day. And I tell people the story when I came to Clear Results. You know, my kids who are young adults now, I think for the longest time of their growing up, dad just went to work. And, you know, and if you asked him what his dad do, yeah, he probably didn't really care. You know, dad just went to work. And when I told them I was coming to this organization, one that really had a purpose and one that could have an impact and really you could measure that impact on communities and on our environment. And they actually said, that's cool. <laughs> it was kind of, yeah, you know, wow. You know, yeah, what feedback from your own kids where they actually now ask me about work as opposed to just assuming work something that happens in the background so there is there's a lot to take i think from being part of this journey and this revolution or this transformation that we're going through and uh for me again i'm really proud to be part of it as well well you should be and i know that we at consumers energy count on the clear result team uh we've been partners for a very long time 
uh, delivering a, a whole wide variety of energy saving methods that can help. When you think about it from a business perspective, when we help a, a, a company reduce their energy waste, they can hire more people. They yeah. can grow their company. They can have a bigger economic impact. That's pure joy for us. And that's how that you know kind of flywheel effect happens. We help them use less energy. They grow their business. We grow with them it, it, that it wins and uh, we can count on you to help us partner to do that. Yeah, no, it's great. And we talked earlier this morning and kicking off that it is, it's this, um, we're not necessarily competitors in this space. Actually, we are, we're, we're all in this together. So utilities across every state who are working through these same goals, these same opportunities, how we share, how we learn. And again, I think we're, our organization's in a great position to take those learnings and to help share them broader. And obviously platforms like this are fantastic for that as well. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I know, I know we're, I think we've got a way for people to ask questions. So I want to make sure that those that are watching that uh, would like to insert questions, please do so. And they're going to feed a few to me. So once that starts, I'll throw in a question or two, but maybe it's wait, wait on that. You know, we're sitting here virtually. Uh, there is no fire around me, but how has, uh, how ha how's the organization? How have you, how has uh, this pandemic impacted, if at all, the journey that you're on? and so the relationship with your customers. How has that changed? Or maybe how has it grown even tighter through this, uh, these, this, this year we've been through? Yeah, you know, um, I'd say a couple ways. One, in terms of our team, I could not be more proud of the way our team has shown up during this time. And we're essential, obviously. Yeah. People need electricity and natural gas as much as ever, and um, so, the fact that we were able to find ways to quickly learn how to work safely and never miss a beat was really amazing. Yeah, I think back to those early days, you know, in March. Seems a long time hard. ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it seems it much does longer seem than like a long time ago. But exactly. It was hard. I was yeah. just looking the other day at some notes my COO and I were trading back and forth some texts, and. Uh, Whew. It was <laughs> it was not you easy know. because yeah. we wanted people to be safe, but we had to keep the lights on, and you know it was just very there was a lot going on, and so I'm very proud of how the team navigated through that. But I believe we navigated through it well because our culture is so strong, and we knew that world class performance delivering hometown service had to show up, and we had to show up like that. And so we really dug into our values and we spent a lot of time talking about caring for each other. That's one of our values and uh, caring for our customers. And so what was neat was how the team who directly serves customers pivoted. Hmm. In those early days, businesses were afraid. They did not know what they were gonna do. And so our call center went from handling complaints to getting schooled up in all of the financial programs that were available. We worked with a law firm to redo all their scripts and we set up a business customer response line that we encouraged people to call us so we could help them get the help they had coming. And maybe that would help them pay their utility bill or maybe not. It might yeah. help them pay their people, whatever it was. We knew that we needed those businesses to get through this whole thing with us. And so the team worked hard to be the kind of company that our customers could count on in these times. Yeah, you certainly have been. And again, thinking back, um, I remember early on, there was this view that it was gonna be like two weeks, this two week interruption. <laughs> That's been much longer than a two week interruption. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Well, we've got a question that came in. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and share this with you. Um, so the question is, you shared a great vision for integration of EVs with the grid. What are your near-term priorities in customer programs or otherwise to support and enable transportation electrification? Well, first and foremost, we are focused on getting that infrastructure installed. Uh, as an EV driver, and you know this too, yeah. we, uh, range anxiety is real. Yeah. Um, once you have vehicles available and you're actually in the showroom thinking about buying this one, you start to think about, well, how do I get from point A to point B? Like, how does that gonna work? And so we want to make sure that that's never a question. So we've got lots of rebate programs, customer programs, both for at home charging, at work charging, and high speed charging out on our road trip alleys, um, which came in handy this last weekend. Um, 
those things, it's, you know, all of those things going together. But I think where the future really lives in that space is this point about helping customers spend the least amount of money to fuel their vehicles yeah. and cause the least amount of stress on the grid. So really making a, a smarter and easy sort of set it, forget it option yeah. for a customer. So we're working closely with the automakers to make sure that we have the right uh, communication platform so that customers will know how and when to charge. Because like you know, and I know, it's very complicated to figure out where you're gonna be at what time and what the charge is gonna be. And right now, to your point, you care less about how much it costs and just that it's there, but there will come a time when it is there and then you will care about how much it costs. Yeah, I know you're absolutely right. And I was blessed that when we were going to the office that our office had a charger. So every day when I went in, I knew I could charge. Now in the absence of that, it is, okay, where am I gonna charge and when can I charge? And, and I think to your point, it is, it's an interesting, um, I'm not calling it a problem, but it's an interesting journey because you've got the manufacturers, so you're upstream, you've got dealers and dealerships midstream and how they feel comfortable communicating and obviously there's risk to their business model as well when you take 500 components down to i forget how many is 50 and you know what it does to their business model and then you've got consumers and overcoming range anxiety and overcoming just the fear and and just the understanding they have or they don't have as it relates to what electric vehicles are and what they aren't um, and the great news i think we're progressing all of those but it really requires all three of those to work together yeah it's good it's gonna be fun yeah, it's it's. I will say this again. Hands up. My my EV is a it's a hybrid in that it's you know it's, so it's a Ford that I'm I can plug in. I get about twenty five miles, and then I've got the gas back up. So thankfully, I've not I've not had the same anxiety that you probably have had when you're looking down. Going, oh my god, I got it. So yeah, it it is like you have to think about it, and I don't want to have to think about it. So you know, exactly. I'm glad I'm having the experience because it's affecting how we're thinking about it. I'm like, well, it can't be this way. Like, it can't be like, you should be able to go wherever you want and not have to worry about it. So you just have to think about it today. Maybe it's just how hard you're putting your foot down on the pedal. <laughs> that, that might have some influence. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned customers earlier. And you know, one of the things that I think is fascinating to me is this journey that utilities have been on. And it, you know, maybe, I don't know if this is the right description, but it's almost like at one point there were meters. And then the meters became rate payers, and now rate payers have become customers. And I, I truly feel, you know, in the way you've described the relationship that your organization has, it, it is customers, that it isn't just a meter that you're billing and collecting from, or a rate payer that you're forced to have a relationship with, but you're truly wanting to engage with them as a, and maybe not even a customer, as much as a partner in this journey. Yeah. We call them friends, families, and neighbors. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what great. they are, right? Yeah, that's, that's great. That's who they are. We have we are blessed to serve. And in fact, my sister lives next door, so I definitely serve my neighbor, my friend, and my family. <laughs> <laughs> We're friends most of the time. <laughs> but you know, um, it is very human. And the service we provide is very human. It's not uh, a technical transaction. It's a human experience of making sure people have light on the darkest night and warmth on the coldest yeah. day. And so, you know, I think when we can design our programs, I'll give you an example. We just announced um, about a week or so ago, an additional $12 million of support for our customers for the first time, business customers and residential customers who are having trouble for the first time. Mm -hmm. Now, we've always had low income programs, but these are sort of for middle income people who for the first time ever need help. Whether it's a small business owner or, you know, a, a person whose company, you know, maybe they're a stewardess or a pilot. Yeah. They're just not working. Uh, they need help for the first time ever. And so uh, we designed this program, but we didn't stop there, like just so that when they call, we have the ability to say, oh, here's what we'll do for you. The team designed these greeting cards to send, we've, we know who's in trouble. We don't have to wait for them to call us. And we know their address, <laughs> Yeah. you know, hello. And so we, I saw the, the draft of the note and it, there's this one that has a sailboat on it and it says, uh, your arrearage is sailing into the sunset. Huh. It's, it's like totally human. You open it up That's and there's great. no like, corporate mumbo jumbo. It says, 
you know, dear Mr. Smith, you have been a long and faithful customer. We see for the first time ever, you're having a little trouble. We're sending your trouble off into the sunset just because. That's fantastic. Consumers energy, you know, that, but you have to have that feeling. Empathy, yeah, real empathy. Yes, yeah, like you have yeah. to really understand the human condition that people have to be able to communicate in that way, not be so corporate and legal mumbo jumbo. Yeah, and, and, and just, I, it's got to build great trust between your friends, your family, and your neighbors, and your organization. And you have to earn that. Yeah, that's right. And if well, you know, do our energy waste reduction programs with you and, you know, customers are a little confused at first. Like, what do you mm -hmm. mean? You're trying to help me use less of your product. That seems yeah. weird. Yeah, there must yeah. be something in it for you. That's right. right. Yeah. And this so, doesn't make sense. Yeah. So when people are looking at you kind of with one eye open, you have to earn the trust so that they know, of course, you would do that because that's just how you are. And I wouldn't say that we're there yet. We're working so hard that, that people would trust us. But we had these thermostat giveaway, Google, and we partnered on giving away 100,000 free Nest thermostats this year. That was another way our team pivoted with COVID because we couldn't get into home. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, something you can get to the doorstep. Yeah, you can do a smart thermostat. Well, yeah. people didn't take them. <laughs> they, like, we couldn't give them away. We gave away a lot, maybe 60,000 of the 100, but we didn't give away 100,000. And so that's a challenge for us. Like, why? Yeah. Why don't they? Why would... Because yeah, at a time when people are spending more. more time, yeah, spending more time in your home, your your own <laughs> bills are going up. You think anything you could do to control that? But they were suspicious. Yeah. And so I think it's a challenge for us to think yeah. through together. Like, what what more can we do to earn the trust of our friends, our families, and our neighbors? That of course, if we would offer that, they would take us up on it because they know that it's in yeah. their best interest, not just ours. Yeah, yeah. You wonder where they're thinking. Oh, are they gonna? Are they gonna be watching me? Are they gonna yeah. be monitoring me? As opposed to no, we just want to help. Really, yeah. all we want to do is help. Exactly, <laughs> and that's you know we couldn't convince people. So Let me remind the audience again. I know we've got a lot of people watching. Feel free to to uh, put some questions in. We'd love to answer your questions that you're thinking as we wait for those. One of the things I wanted to kind of to ask you is we talked about you know you've got a plan now that is 20 years. Uh, the clock is ticking, and and again, there's not line of sight probably to everything that's going to happen in those 20 years. But maybe in the next five, where you have greater line of sight, are there some things that you really see that are whether it's transformational or just great sticks in the ground where you can say, look at the progress we've made over those next five years to, to help make sure you're on track to deliver where you want to be in 2040 and where yeah, you will the be. The two big things is the solar market that we've created now mm -hmm. in Michigan. You know, one of the big things that we did in our clean energy plan that allowed, that enabled us to have the support of the Sierra Club, who's never signed off on one of our plans before, by the way, mm -hmm. and our largest business customers, and never had the two of them signed off on anything at the same time because it was clean and affordable. And so part of what made our, our solar commitment affordable is we've created this marketplace. We're going to do an annual bidding and let the best, lowest cost, best siting, newest technology bid on that new solar. It would be very typical of a utility to say we're just going to build it all because that's rate based and that's how we yeah. make money yeah yeah but we knew that there was a pathway that required innovation from others yeah. and others best ideas and so that's a big thing i'm excited about our plan but the other big thing and so in the near term on that solar 1100 megawatts in the next three years now we're going from four megawatts you can count them <laughs> today <laughs> to 1100 in three years. That's huge. That's, that's huge. A total, that's a big combined cycle gas. Transformational. Plan. Yeah, that's transformational. With this competitive marketplace. So I'm excited about that. But the other thing is demand response. Yeah. And having optimized demand, this thermostat deal, a smart thermostat with the right platform you don't have to just interrupt air conditioning anymore. That's the old school way. And we still yeah. have that, but that's old school. The new school allows us to pre-cool homes. We can optimize all those resources across the grid based on machine learning and literally artificial intelligence, 
on the platform for the first time ever. Look, it was two years ago. We all we knew about a customer's usage was how much they used in the last month. We didn't know when they used it, how they, what their profile. Yeah. Was. It's totally everything was in arrears. It's a new ball game, and so optimizing demand and softening that peak with technology, while we're adding modular renewables, I'm telling you, it's a totally different ball. Game. It's exciting, and and you're absolutely right. The thought of now having appliance level usage patterns. And to your point, not just having a switch that's on off, but the ability to modulate, the ability to uh, to predict, the ability to adapt, all of those things just weren't there. And I think, you know, as you said earlier, the ability to let the market bring innovation is fantastic. Because I think in the absence of that, we'd probably just still have switches. We'd have on and off and allowing the market to bring solutions forward and, and almost challenging them say, look, we're going from four to 1100. We've got to do something different or it's yeah. not going to happen. Market come back with the solutions. I mean, that just, I mean, there's people in, in, in their homes and garages and school that are inspired by that to say, you know what, I'm going to give this thought and I'm going to come forward with something that I think can transform and be revolutionary, not just evolutionary. Well, and I think it turns the utility uh, relationship with these new technologies from an adversarial one to a, a partnership. Yeah. And so even with these these homes with the smart thermostats and being able to set a comfort band for a customer, you know what we need to make that true? An efficient home, mm -hmm. a home that has great insulation yeah. and doesn't have leakage so that when we cool it, it stays cool. And when we heat it, it stays warm. You know, again, Clear result to your team and our programs with you and all the utilities across the country. These are all things that all of us can do. And we will just be able to continue to move the needle together. Yeah, it's exciting. It's really exciting times. Well, I can sense the passion you have for this. And I know it's real personal to you. Um, I know that this is something that isn't just what you do every day. But I mean, as a native, I think this is incredibly personal to you, not just for your family, your friends and your neighbors, but for, frankly, I think all of the communities in the state and for all of those that will continue to be along this journey in the years to come. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It is personal and it's a blessing to be able to uh, do work that actually changes lives. And I know at Clear Result and you and your team uh, do the same. And so that's why I think our partnership's been so strong and long lasting. Yeah, and thank you for the opportunity to continue to serve your customers on your behalf. We take great pride in it, and it's exciting to be part of this journey together. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks again. It was great seeing you. Look forward to our game in November. I don't even know when it is now. but uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's that Thanksgiving game or not. I don't either. It might be later. Yeah, I need to check the schedule, but a side bet may be coming. That would be good. Yeah, thanks again. It was great seeing you. Enjoy the rest of your week and stay safe.